Hey, my name's Caleb, and I'm the pastor at Cross of Life, and we're so thankful that you clicked on this video. We really pray that it benefits you, it grows your faith, or maybe introduces you to Jesus in a way that you've never been introduced before. But what we also want for you is to be connected to a local congregation. So if Cross of Life is your home congregation, we're glad that you make use of these resources, but make sure that this never comes in the place of coming together for worship with the body of believers. Let's be a church that values in-person gathering when so much of life is digital. And if you're somebody who's not from Mississauga, uh, get in touch with the local church in your area. It can be so easy to pick and choose, oh, I like this preacher or I like this message, but never actually invest in the place that Jesus says that he is, in his body, the church. And we encourage you to take time to put yourself into his body, in a local congregation, so that you can pray for one another, love one another, support one another, forgive one another, do all the things that the scripture talks about for one another. So we hope you're blessed by this video, and we hope that we get the chance to see you in person sometime soon. Well, welcome back, everyone, for another week of How to Grow and Why We Don't. We've been studying Jesus' parable of the sower uh, to see these obstacles to spiritual growth that Jesus identifies as people hear the word like, like uh, ground receiving seed that is scattered by a farmer. They receive it in different ways, and Jesus says, let's look at ourselves, ask ourselves, what are the obstacles that are in my life that keep me from hearing God's word, receiving the blessings, and becoming fruitful? We worked our way through three of the soils in the parable of the soil, the path of the hard-packed ground, the rocky soil, and the weedy soil. And we are going to get finally to the good soil next week. We're actually going to take a short detour out of the parable of the sower to another parable that Jesus actually tells, and in fact, two other parables that Jesus tells in the context of the parable of the sower. So Jesus tells the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. He also tells it in Matthew 13. We're going to look at those chapters and see two other parables that Jesus tells in connection with the parable of the sower that lets us in on this last threat to spiritual growth which you can see on the screen, is impatience. So we'll start with the text from Mark. I'll read it for us, and then we'll begin our study. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk and the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. This is the gospel of the Lord. So today we're going to break the teaching into three parts. If you grabbed a note sheet from the back, you can see those three parts in front of you. We're going to talk about patience with God, patience with ourselves, and patience with others, as I told the children. Um, So let's start by diving into patience with God. What does Jesus say in the parable that he gives us from Mark? He says that plants, seeds, grow slowly. The kingdom is God, God is like this. Seed gets planted and day after day you don't always notice the growth, but at the end of the season when the harvest comes, you have full grain, grain, uh, kernels of grain in the plant. You receive the harvest. Jesus wants us to start to realize the slowness of the kingdom of God, which, as I have alluded to, is really hard for us. In a world that is fast-paced, when we can get just about anything that we want through the internet and one day shipping from Amazon, we can begin to think that, well, the best things in life are the things that you can get immediately. I mean, you go down a whole list of things, not just shopping, but streaming, for example. You don't have to go to the video store or the red box anymore, if you even remember what those things are. You can just go to your TV and with a few pushes of a button, watch a movie that wasn't even made in your country. Or it can be how quickly we get food, right? Food that we want, slow cooked, slow aged, but we want it five minutes from the time we tell the guy at the drive-thru. Or if we even go to the drive-thru, we might actually have somebody else go to the drive-thru for us so we don't have to move from our couch where we're watching the streaming that we don't have to wait for. You can see how this goes. We're so used to things being fast, so it is is almost grating on us when God says the kingdom of God is, is slow. And I believe that that, that impatience in every one of us is one of the reasons that we don't spiritually grow, we don't spiritually mature, we don't become fruitful. We expect the kingdom of God to happen right now, and when it doesn't, 
we're frustrated. So we'll look at those three ways, starting with patience with God. One of the things that is unavoidable as you read the scripture is that you realize that God is slow. God is slow. On the very first pages of the Bible, God creates the world perfect, puts Adam and Eve in that world, and they believe Satan's lie that God is holding out on him, that that God's word isn't actually true, and they, they eat the fruit that they're not supposed to eat, and sin comes into the world God curses Adam, he curses Eve, and he curses the serpent, but alongside that curse of the serpent is the first promise of a savior. That this way that the world is now, dying you will die, is not how it will always be. There will be a seed of the woman who will come and crush the serpent's head. Martin Luther, in commenting on this text from Genesis, says that um, just a chapter later, when Eve has her first son, Cain, the way the, the Hebrew that, that Eve speaks is structured, it seems to be that Eve actually thinks that this seed of the woman is Cain. That Cain will be the savior of the world because God promised. Of course, in our hindsight, we realize that's not what was going to happen. God was going to be much slower. He was going to take thousands of years to finally show up to Mary and tell her that she was going to produce the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. But up to that point, God was slow, wasn't he? Over those thousands of years, multiple iterances of God being slow show up in the scripture. He makes uh, Noah wait over 100 years from the moment that he's told there's going to be a flood on the earth till the moment the rains actually start coming. He tells Abraham, you're going to have a son but waits decades until that son comes. Similarly with Isaac. God's people go into slavery in Egypt. God waits over 400 years of slavery before he sends Moses to bring them out of slavery. On the road to the promised land, which took more than 40 years to get to, and then when they get to that promised land, it's a while before a kingdom is established under David. And David wanted to make a great temple for the worship of the Lord, but God made him wait too, in fact, wait until after he died, and said, the temple will be built by your son Solomon. Of course, after that temple was built, the Babylonian captivity exiled all of God's people from their land, and God made them wait 70 years in exile to come back to the promised land, and God made them wait for his word. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, written about 350 years before John the Baptist is in the wilderness proclaiming, make straight paths for the Lord. God is slow. And it's not just the Old Testament, the New Testament testifies to the same, right? God sends that seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head, but there isn't a cross next to a cradle. That baby is born and that baby lives for 30 years before he even starts his ministry. I mean, so far as we can tell, Jesus just lived a normal young Jewish boy life. I mean, of course, he was the son of God, but nothing was so amazing about his life at that point that it needed to be included in the scriptures, save one instance at the temple when he was 12. And then God sent Jesus not just to die at 30, but to die after three years of ministry, proclaiming the same message that John proclaimed, the kingdom of God has come near. And then Jesus died, and he rose, And he promised that he was coming back 2,000 years ago. God has once again been making us wait because God is slow. But there's another way that God is slow that is absolutely wonderful for people like us. It's recorded for us when God tells Moses who he is. Maybe you remember this. Moses says, God, I want to experience your presence. I want to see you. I want to know you. And God says, you can't because you are sinful and I am holy and you would die if you saw me. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn you around and I'm going to walk past you and I'm going to tell you my name. And do you remember what he says? He says, my name is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Your God is slow. And that's a feature, not a bug. If he was efficient, if he was get it done, if he was checkbox God, we would not be here. God would have seen each of us conceived in sinfulness in our mother's womb and said, nope, I can't have another one. God is slow to anger. God does not give us what our sins deserve. 
Jesus' friend Peter tells us about this similarly in the New Testament when he says, do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So why is God slow? So that you would repent, which is really good news. For some of you who maybe aren't sure if you're a Christian or struggling with it, God is patient. He's giving you the time, another opportunity to hear his word and to come to him in repentance. For those of you who are Christians, a growing in Christian faith has become sort of an afterthought, a nice to do if I can, but not a priority of my life. Sure, I believe in Jesus, but a fruitful life, a life not filled with weeds? Well, God is patient with you. Another opportunity to hear his word and to repent. And for those of us who actually think we're doing pretty well, who maybe are starting to pull the weeds from our life, but like the older sons in the parable of the prodigal son, we think our good works are what make us holy, what make us good with God, make us lovable with God, and God says patiently again, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. I don't care about what you produce. You're not here to do good works. You are here to be loved by me, and I still do. God is slow, which means practical application. There's, there's one thing that defines the way God works, and that is that God works in small things. He works in small things. When you have a time horizon like God does, like I told the children, an eternal time horizon, you have the ability to work slow and in small things. Just for contrast, uh, this year we will have uh, a federal election for the President of the United States. Next year we will have a federal election for the uh, parties of our parliament here in Canada. And so the parties and the leaders are proclaiming what they're going to do when they get in power, hopefully. And those ideas are usually big, massive changes that is gonna make everything right. You probably heard some of these. That's because they know they have to, um, a best before date. A future president, Harris or Trump, will have four years to do the work that they want to do before another election comes for the president of the United States. However, our parliament shakes out in 2025, it will be five years or maybe even less before there's another vote on who is going to be in power. And because you only have a short time horizon, you have to do big things and you have to do them quickly. And if you've ever watched big policy change in politics, you know that very often there are implications to those decisions that people couldn't identi have identified before, or the change is not actually sustainable. It's good at first, but after a while it deteriorates, or the next person in power just repeals it or changes it anyways. When you have a short time horizon, you have to do big things and you have to make big changes, but God is not up for a vote. He is the eternal God who was forever and is now and will be forever. And so he has the ability to make sustainable change in the small things of life, which if you study sociology, you know this is the best way to make change. You can make a policy about family, but nothing beats strong family structure. Mothers and fathers married to each other, raising children to be good citizens. No policy can overcome that. You could talk about how the economy works. We could change this thing or that thing about how dollars are spent or saved or invested, but there's nothing for financial liter nothing that can beat financial literacy among a population. You make policies about crime, but nothing beats a society that actually feels like they don't have to exact things from each other violently. See, small little changes over time are what actually produce real good growth, and God works in those things. God works in the small things of life. He works in the things that are unimportant, at least seemingly to the world, those things that you may not notice right away, he works like, well, a seed. That's what he says in Matthew 13. After telling the parable of the sower, he says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. God is slow. And that's really good news for us. But I don't think we're ready for it. We would love God to work in the big things of life, to give us the miraculous healings or the miraculous giving of wealth, to give us a new job tomorrow, to help us fix our relationship overnight, 
to help our health get better. We might want all these big things, and, and they might just not, not just be problems that we want solved, but just our experience of God in general, that I would come to worship on Sunday and it would be an exhilarating experience, or my prayer life would feel just hot all the time, like I, I'm just connecting with God, or when I open the scripture, it's just what I needed to hear today. We want that. But you know that's not how it is. Sometimes you come to worship, and the preacher's a little bit off his game, and the music isn't balanced correctly, and nobody smiles or greets you, and honestly, you kind of think to yourself, it wouldn't have made a difference if I just stayed home this week. Or sometimes you you open your heart to God in prayer, but the words aren't coming. You don't know what to say. And frankly, you've prayed for the stuff that you've prayed for a hundred times before, and it doesn't seem like anything's changing anyways. Or you've opened your Bible to a section you've already studied. I know this section. Or to a section that you've never studied before. I'm not getting anything out of this. I mean, that's how most of us experience our spiritual life. And we might be able to become discouraged with God, right? To say, "This, this isn't working. But God says, no, I work in those small things. Those little average moments. Those things that don't seem important. So be patient with God. The reason I think this is an obstacle to our spiritual growth is that we expect things to happen quickly. We expect growth to happen overnight. Maybe you've been listening to this series and you've thought about the weeds and you've thought about the rocks and you've thought about the hard path of your heart that very often rejects God's word and you start to think to yourself, well, I I can, I'm going to, in fact, make changes in my life. And, And maybe you have. And nothing's changed, really, actually. Like, you feel the same about God, and you, you treat your, your spouse or your kids the same way. You're still as irritated about work as you were two weeks ago. I mean, nothing seems to be changing. God says, be patient with me. Maybe another way to think about this. Sometimes people will come to me as a pastor, and they'll say, um, Pastor, what do I do about this problem? It doesn't matter what the problem is. And, and there's so many times where I think to myself, you don't just need a solution. You need to grow as a Christian. Like, I can give you a Bible verse, but if you're not ready to receive that verse from a heart of good soil that understands who God is and how God works, you're not going to be satisfied. God is not into quick fixes. He's into shaping you as a human being. And it's not that the, man, the answers don't matter, but friends, we have a lot of answers, a lot of clickbait, a lot of quick reels and shorts to tell us answers. What we don't have a lot of is formation into people of God that happens over time in his word. So be patient with God. And then be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. Like I illustrated to the children, uh, there could be times when you, you do actually feel like you're learning from God and you're growing closer to God, and maybe you even feel like I'm starting to be shaped into the form of, of a, a godly person. And then come those moments or maybe even those seasons where that growth seems negligible or maybe even working in reverse, where the growth that I wish was happening, I want to happen, I, I'm, I'm putting myself in a position for it to happen, it just doesn't seem like it's happening. Like I might think to myself, you know, I, I know that when I, I blow up at my kids or my spouse, that does not make for a happy, holy home. I know that when I go to work with a bad attitude, I am first of all not blessing others with my work, and I am in fact giving a bad name to the Christians that I, I work alongside. But God says be patient with yourself. He, he says in this parable that we ought to be patient with ourselves. Did, did you hear it? He says in Mark chapter 4, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed in the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. He doesn't know. It's not that he doesn't intellectually know how seeds work. I mean, he's a farmer. But it's that he doesn't see the growth day after day. And Satan loves that. Satan has two lies that he likes to bring against us when we start down the path of spiritual growth. The first of those lies is he'll tell us that won't work. 
I know that the pastor said that, that your life will be full of blessing if you take time for rest in your life, or if you're willing to cut back on some of the things that fill your eyes or your ears in entertainment, or if you're willing to cut back on how much you consume and instead think about being generous, you'll be so blessed. And I know the pastor said that, but let's be clear, that won't work. Maybe it won't work for me, right? Like I'll say it about myself, it's my, my life is... It just doesn't work in my life, my situation, my family, my job, my marriage, my personality, like that doesn't work for me. Or it might just be that it doesn't work at all. I mean, really, you, you telling me that if I stop working, I'm actually going to be more of a blessing to people? You're telling me that if I give away my wealth, I'm actually going to be more blessed and more rich in spiritual things? That won't work. But it's a lie. Satan is a liar. So if you get past the first lie and you say, okay, no, Satan, I believe God's word and God says that this is where spiritual growth happens. Well, Satan's not done with you. After you start down the path of spiritual growth, then he'll say, this isn't working. Sure, you started. And sure, maybe some little things are changing, but let's be honest. This is going to take too long. There's too much sacrifice over too much time. Is it really worth it? Is this really working for you? Well, that's a lie. Satan wants you to believe that, that since things aren't happening as quickly as you would like or in a way that you can notice, that it's not worth it. But Jesus wants you to know that's exactly how it works. And it's totally worth it. What does he say in the parable? The seed grows, the farmer doesn't know how, but eventually there is a stalk and then grain in the stalk and then a harvest that he puts his sickle to. Good comes out of that slow waiting. So let me help you think about this. You know who's the person who's going to most often not notice spiritual growth in your life? You. You're probably not going to notice it. I mean, there's really practical reasons for this. You look at yourself every day. You evaluate yourself every day. You think about what you were like yesterday, the day before, the day before that. You consistently do this. So it's hard for you to step back and look at yourself over a long period of time. You're like a person looking down where they planted a seed seven minutes ago and saying, how come it's not sprouting? That's what we do with our own spiritual growth. So God would actually ask us to lean into those who see us from a different perspective. I have the privilege of being your pastor now for six years. And even over my short six-year span as being your pastor, I've seen spiritual growth in your lives. You maybe don't always notice it. You maybe feel like you're no different than you were six years ago, but I see amazing things that God works in your life. Some of you who have increased in your generosity with your money or with your time. Those of you who have become better fathers, husbands, wives, mothers. Those of you who have seen God's word as a, even more of a priority, that you don't just show up for worship every week, but devotional lives in your families have become a priority. I see people who used to struggle with personal conflict but now are able to approach others who they disagree with or don't get along with, with peace and patience. And you maybe don't see those things, but I get to. You're growing. Be patient with yourself. And then finally, be patient with others. Have you ever had those situations where maybe you're dealing with somebody that you don't get along with and you've had the conversations, this is not okay, this, this hurts my feelings, this isn't productive for us. And they nod in agreement and they say yeah and they say sorry, but maybe even just a couple hours later you're in the same conflict again. Or maybe it's a person that you interact with here at church and your personalities just don't get along. You're like this, she's like that, he's like this. And, and you're so tempted to just say, that person's a write-off. You know what? Fine, they can be at church here with me, but I'm not going to talk. I don't want to deal with them. Maybe some of you have had kids, and you know it's like the, the thousandth and fourth time that you've told them something, and they know, and you know, they don't do it. Or maybe you're a pastor, and you look at God's people, and you know that you're supposed to, after six years, see spiritual growth, and in some people you see it, but others you wonder. It can be easy to become impatient, why aren't they growing? But God said that we ought to be patient with others in the same way that we are patient with ourselves. That God's growth of another person is going to be slow. That we would love if a person would change overnight so that they wouldn't have that attitude or they wouldn't say those things or they wouldn't care so much about those things or spend their time or money on those things. 
But God is growing all of us, and he's growing us slowly. And that's good news, because that's how God deals with us. God has patience with us that we are growing much slow, more slowly than maybe he would prefer, but he is patient with us, wanting to bring us to repentance, and he calls us to the same with others. So who will it be? Maybe for you, someone's coming to mind right now, someone in this room, or someone back home, or someone at work. Can you be patient with them? And realize that God is doing something for them that might be different than what he's doing for you. Maybe to help us press this down on ourselves, I want you to think of two things that are true about plants that I think are helpful for us in considering how to be patient with others. The first is that plants grow differently in different conditions. Or you can have two of the exact same plant, but if you plant one on this side of the yard and one on this side of the yard, based on the way the shade and the sun and the soil is different, they can grow differently. Or maybe you can plant one plant in one country and the same plant in another country, and a different climate will affect the plant differently. Different conditions make different plants grow differently. What if that was also true of people? What if some things are easy for you, some growth is obvious in your life, but that's mostly a product of your conditions? You're in the marriage that you're in. You live in the house that you live in, in the neighborhood that you live in. You work the job that you work. You had the parents that you had or the education that you had. You have the friends that you have. You have the personality that you have. You have the skills that you have. And you look at somebody else and you say, why can't they grow like I'm growing? I mean, we're in the same church. We're hearing the same word. Why, why not? Well, maybe because they're in different conditions. We could be patient with them. Or maybe they're just completely different plants. <laughs> Right, you can plant two plants in the same soil and they will grow differently because they're different plants. Now, God has made each one of us unique, knit us together in our mother's womb with a purpose to be a blessing to other people with good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do in our unique vocations and spots in life. You are who you are in the place that you are because only you could be there to accomplish God's purpose. If I was there, I would not accomplish it the same way you would because you are you. You're the sex, or the age, or the skin color, or the background, or the skill set, or the personality, or the wealth, or lack of wealth that you are, because God wants you there, which means you're different from me. And in the same way two plants planted right next to each other might grow differently, in the same way two of us in this same church hearing the same word from God every Sunday might grow differently, because God's doing something different. He's sending you back to your home, to your work, to your life, to do different things than He's sending me home to do. And maybe we could be patient. Let's sum it up this way. God is found in the insufficient, the small, and the seemingly unimportant things of life. That's exactly how he wants to be found. And that's exactly where growth happens. He's found in the unexciting worship service. He's found in resolving another conflict with that person. He's found in the small prayers that you personally do or you do around the table with your family. He's found in worship that, yeah, I could have watched it online, but I went out of my way to be here. God works in those small, insufficient, and seemingly unimportant things. And that's a perspective shift for us. But if we're willing to take that perspective, we will find the growth that God wants us to find. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next month, maybe even not next year, but as you look back on a life lived in Christ, you will see growth, you will see blessings, and you can be thankful. So let's wait on the Lord, the psalm says. We're going to pray it in a few minutes, we're going to sing it a few minutes after that. Wait for the Lord and let him bring his blessings. Let's pray for that patience. God, we want the answers right now. We wish that all things could be fixed right now. We crave heaven right now, but you have left us here that we could be fruitful plants, blessing the others around us. So we ask that you would make us patient. First of all, that we would be patient with you. We would understand that you are slow to anger, that you want all people to come to repentance, and that you work slowly. We would also be patient with ourselves. As you work on us, we would understand that we will be in our sanctification, a work in progress, until we get to be home with you. And finally, make us patient with others, that we can enjoy the blessing that you have of the different plants growing in your garden alongside each other, blessing the world and this community in the unique ways which you have created us. We ask that in your name. Amen.